this is joint work with uh, Wei Zhang, who hopefully will be joining us around uh, two thirty uh, your time. So I want to just first start with a bit of the motivation for this paper. So there have been two important trends with the booming digital economy. The first is a growing popularity of cryptocurrencies and tokens. As of May 2020, there were at least 4,100 tokens, uh, not including many that have failed. And as of 2021, at least 16% of US adults have had some experience using, investing, and or trading cryptocurrencies. Uh, and the second, which may seem seemingly unrelated to the first, is that there's a growing tension between digital platforms and their users. And when we're thinking about these digital platforms, we're thinking about very large digital platforms like Google, uh, Facebook, and Amazon. So there have been recent concerns about the exploitation of users' data privacy, uh, antitrust concerns about competition and price discrimination in big tech. And this has led to a number of regulatory responses, especially in the EU. And I'm particularly happy to be presenting to an EU audience uh, because a lot of the policy work we see in this area is coming from reports written um, by EU policymakers. So we have data privacy regulations in the EU like GDPR, we have CCPA in the US, as well as the Colorado and Virginia Privacy Acts. South America is like the GDPR in many ways for the privacy acts they have, and there's also Japan. So what we want to argue in this paper is that tokenization may represent a market-based effort to resolve the conflict between platforms and users. So crypto technology makes it possible to delegate control to a set of what are called pre-coded algorithms via, for instance, smart contracts. And a lot of this kind of underpins the excitement about Bitcoin. If you read the original white paper by Satoshi, a lot of the early enthusiasm for Bitcoin was about this notion of decentralization, moving outside the conventional monetary system, retaking control, in this case, of, a mo of monetary policy with Bitcoin. But since then, it's expanded to a variety of other applications. And if you read some papers such as Harvey et al. 2020, there's a lot of excitement for decentralization's potential to democratize finance. And this is often what's referred to as DeFi for decentralized, uh, DeFi for decentralized finance. So how do we think about tokenization of digital platforms? Well, the typical way this occurs is a developer will develop a platform and then get paid by issuing coins and tokens rather than traditional equity shares. This is often what's called an ICO, although they're not as popular as they were in the past, we're just gonna take this as the mechanism to illustrate what we hope is a deeper point. So tokenization is gonna facilitate decentralization through what are called decentralized autonomous organizations. And I'll give you a nice quote in a second to kind of say, talk, uh, illustrate the enthusiasm surrounding um, this, these sorts of entities. So how does a DAO work? Well, a DEO is arguably fully decentralized and governance is done among users through sophisticated voting mechanisms. For instance, you may vote on platform improvement protocols via staking, or they may issue governance tokens, such as what you would see with Terra Luna, where Luna would be the governance token, giving voting rights for altering the Terra platform. And some examples of these platforms are listed below. Uh, prominent ones are MakerDAO and Decred Aragon Kyber. Um, the most popular type of tokens used on these platforms were to call utility tokens, Although there are various other extensions of it, there are coins and security tokens, but what are utility tokens for the sake of the presentation? Well, a utility token is gonna to give a user some sort of convenience yield, like a transaction benefit. So some examples of what these convenience yield could be, well, it may be about being able to write smart contracts. I wanna sell my house, so I put my house as a non-fungible token, so an NFT onto the blockchain, and then I'm gonna sell it via that. And we can put all sorts of contingencies, such as you know, requiring title insurance, requiring that the bank provides a loan, all sorts of contingencies can be done directly through this platform's uh, coding mechanism. So smart contracts are a key part of the excitement, but there's also storage, such as file storage with Filecoin and storage, gaming, and there's a lot of excitement nowadays about decentralized gaming. And there's also gambling as an early application via Dragoncoin. So there are a variety of different types of utilities that people can get from these platforms. We're gonna stay in the abstract level, but I want you to keep these kind of in mind. So as I said, I would be providing a quote. This comes from the CEO of Shapeshift about a year and a half ago. So I'll just paraphrase, but essentially it's unorthodox, but it, it, it's decentralization is the only way to maintain fidelity 
to the most important principles of crypto, specifically self-sovereignty over money. So the, there is a new kind of firm, the decentralized autonomous organization. So paraphrasing the, the argument that the CEO was making on Twitter is that maybe the way of doing a firm where you have shareholders and management may have been appropriate during the industrial age. But now that we have online platforms with online communities that bring together themselves and provide some sort of benefit for each other, maybe we need a more democratic system. And that's kind of what the DAO hopes to accomplish. So I'll give two examples of platforms again to try to demystify these a bit. So Filecoin goes back to 2017. It is probably the most widely cited platform in terms of academic literature. It is the go-to example that people use for what uh, tokenization can do. So what's Filecoin? It's gonna match buyers and sellers of storage on their hard drive. So a buyer wants to store their data securely. They're gonna break up that data file into hundreds of little bits. And then sellers are gonna store that, that data on their excess hard drives. So you have excess hard drive space, you're not using it, you don't need to save a lot of things. You're selling that to a buyer who demands privacy and demands security. And then there are record locators who disassemble and reassemble the scattered files. They're kind of the ones who know where all the bits are located across computers across the world. So miners are gonna record these addresses of these scattered file pieces on the blockchain. And the way that consensus is achieved on this decentralized platform is you have what are called Filecoin Improvement protocol, uh, Protocols or FIPS. So this part is a little bit less discussed among academics, but it's kind of cool. So essentially anytime the community wants to improve Filecoin, they're gonna to come together, they're gonna to read over the white paper for the proposal, they can talk on Discord, and they can try to reach consensus by voting. And this is kind of novel, considering conventional platforms would have Google's management, for instance, deciding on what would happen with Google's search algorithm. So another example is Tezos. So this one also started in 2017 with its ICO, but launched in 2018. So this one's a bit more closer to what would be considered Bitcoin or Ether. It's gonna allow for peer-to-peer -peer transactions and smart contracts. And governance is done via two stages. In the first stage, developers propose a improvement. In the second stage, it's voted upon. And developers are paid in newly minted Tezos. So I really wanna emphasize that this is a platform run by users. Um, and that's gonna be important for the key conflict we're gonna to try to explore. So what are the conceptual questions we have in mind for today's talk? Well, what are the pros and cons of tokenized platforms relative to their conventional equity-based counterparts? Is decentralization desirable for all platforms or can we provide some cross-sectional predictions? How do outside investors and consensus validators impact decentralization? So I'm gonna first consider a simplified setting while abstract from these important issues about outside investors and consensus but I'll return to those toward the end of the talk. And we think that's important because casual observation says that these two groups are important on cryptocurrency platforms. A lot of discussion, if you look in the academic literature, for instance, is about consensus protocols. So we do wanna say something about that too. So where are gonna be the key insights? Well, we're gonna highlight what we believe is a novel tension between network effects and decentralization. So network effects are, of course, important on these platforms. This goes back as early as Roche and Tyrol. But what's kind of new here is there's decentralization and decentralization is gonna have a cost. So the way this is gonna work is each user is gonna have a participation cost to join the platform. And a owner would love to subsidize the marginal user because they're increasing returns to this network effect but decreasing marginal returns for the last one who enters. So what the owner would wanna do is get as many people on the platform as possible initially through subsidization. And we do kind of see this in practice. Google and Facebook provide free services such as email and search and messaging to attract users. And through that, they're able to have a large network effect and become very dominant platforms. So what we wanna argue is a conventional platform has an owner with equity and control to subsidize participation, but the owner can't pre-commit not to exploit users when the profit is low. And that's going to be the key tension is this lack of commitment. So in contrast to that, we can have decentralization, which we're going to call trustless. Why? Because it's, it's a term that refers to the notion that if you have an anonymous platform where 
consensus and and um, and in, uh, consensus is achieved without needing a central authority such as an intermediary, you don't need trust of the intermediary on the platform. So it's trustless if it's anonymous and decentralized. And this may be appealing when the expected platform fundamental is relatively weak. So we're going to argue a conventional platform makes sense if ex ante, you think this is a really good idea because you're never going to run into the situation where you're going to want to exploit users. On the other side, if profits are expected to be low, then you won't be able to control yourself as an owner in the, in the future. And so you may want to decentralize and, and basically disintermediate the platform immediately to avoid this conflict of interest in the future. So that's going to be the baseline model. And as I said, we're going to have two extensions where we consider investors and consensus validators. And we're going to argue that democracy of decentralization is very fragile. So it's beautiful when you're able to give control to users and they can operate the platform. But there's always tensions to try to re-centralize the platform. So if you pay dividends on tokens, for instance, that's great for subsidization because now the marginal guy also will get a dividend and he's going to be more excited to join the platform. But you have a dividend paying token, now it invites outside investors who just want to speculate. And if they get a controlling interest in the platform, then you're going to have re-centralization as if there's a new de facto owner. On the other side, you have consensus validators who are the ones completing all transactions. Oh, so why are the incentives only when profits are low? That'll be part of the outcome of the model. So I'll kind of defer that and hopefully that will come out in about, I think, 10 slides. But that, that's kind of an outcome rather than an ex ante assumption. So consensus validators are the ones who are adding these transactions to the blockchain. Proof of work is the most popular, but there's also proof of stake. It's kind of become a rising star because of the energy needs of proof of work. We're going to argue that these validators act as de facto owners. So because they have control of the platform by completing these transactions, they may have incentive to attack the blockchain also when the platform's profits are low. And so that'll, that'll kind of be the way I wrap up this talk. So there's a beautifully uh, growing literature in this area with notable contributions from my discussants. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through all of them, but it's a very exciting space with a lot of novel ideas. And hopefully if uh, you're in the space, you might see your name. If not, I apologize just for the sake of brevity, these are the ones we listed. So I'm just gonna jump right into the model and, and try to walk through the baseline model slowly because once we get through the baseline model, Everything else is just going to be some sort of um, augmentation or adaptation of it. So consider three dates, zero, one, and two. There's a digital platform that's going to facilitate bilateral transactions among users. This is at a very abstract level, but think of it as I want to do file sharing. So one side will be the buyer, the other will be the supplier of storage. It could be about buying a car. One side is going to sell the car to another, and it might be a specialized type of car that requires a very rarefied um, platform to be able to find a buyer. But there are many examples that this sort of paradigm can fit into. So at t equals zero, a developer is gonna choose between either an equity-based or a token-based funding scheme. So equity-based is gonna be kind of a conventional platform, a la Roche and Tirol, for instance. So the owner is just gonna operate the platform for both dates. The owner is going to subsidize users at t equals one to maximize the network effect. And the way that the owner is going to be compensated is he's going to charge a fraction of surplus of fees. So a fraction of every user's transaction will be eaten up by the owner to compensate him for running the platform. The key tension is that at t equals two, the final date in which there's a second round of transactions, the owner may choose to exploit the user data if the fee is low. So if the fee is low is going to be the outcome. So the owner can choose to exploit user data. But of course, because users anticipate that they're going to be exploited at time two, this may undermine participation at time one by rational expectations. It may be the reverse may be true. So we can discuss that a bit later, what sort of micro foundation would lead to different predictions. But I think it's still interesting to say that if you can't commit, you may have a potential to do something in the future. So that can come to which, that may come to the prediction of which platforms would be decentralized, but I think the deeper point that exploitation introduces a reason 
her tokenization will still be true. So with t equals two, the owner can choose to take what we'll call a subversive action. We're gonna leave that fairly reduced form, but the important thing is users anticipate. So if users know they're gonna be exploited at time two, that's gonna undermine the desire to join the platform at time one by acting as an effective tax on their participation. So what is the alternative? So that's the equity-based scheme. The owner operates it for both periods. There's also a token-based scheme. So the platform will issue tokens at t equals one to pay off the developer and the developer exits. So the owner is gone. There is no longer an owner. So once it's decentralized, there's no authority to exploit user data or to subsidize participation. Although I won't show you today, we do show that users don't have incentive to vote against themselves. They're not gonna exploit themselves because they're shooting themselves in the foot. So this is a frictionless platform. So we're assuming all consensus is frictionless. Again, we'll return to consensus issues a bit later. So users buy tokens at time one, and then they transact with each other at time one and time two, just as they would on the equity-based platform. So those are the two types of schemes, either equity or it's gonna to be tokens. So how do users work? So there's gonna be, okay. uh, a token is gonna to be a, um, a, like a medallion of membership on this platform. So if you buy a token, it's gonna to give you a right to participate on the platform at both dates. So you can think at an abstract level, you buy the token, and then when you trade with a trading partner during the uh, platform's operation, you share the token by uh, transacting. So you trade tokens with each other, and that's how you use to pay for goods and services on the platform. So we're not gonna get into the specific details of how you convert between numeraire and token pricing, but essentially tokens are what give you a right to be on the platform. Yes, so the, that, that's all gonna come up when I get to consensus validation. So the question is, uh, validators will not want to exploit users when they make a lot of money. That's exactly what we're gonna show, uh, which can be a risk if they exploit users. That's correct. So again, that's gonna give us predictions about when uh, validators will want to attack the platform. So the platform fundamental is strong. Uh, validators don't have incentive to attack it because they're gonna make a lot of money. And when the platform is sufficiently weak, you're gonna have an adverse feedback effect, which is that the profits from, the, from consensus validation are low, so if I mine or I stake, I'm gonna get a low profit. And this makes the platform vulnerable to attack because at that point you have less effort um, expended by validators. So that's gonna introduce sort of a fragility there. But again, that's getting a bit ahead, but it's a well taken point. So users, there's gonna be a continuum of potential users, each joining the platform at T equals one. Each user is gonna incur a personal cost kappa. So if you wanna join the platform, in addition to potentially buying a token, you have to pay a participation cost kappa. And what happens when you're on the platform, each user is gonna get an endowment, e to the AI, where AI is some common fundamental and then some idiosyncratic component across users. So some users get more benefit than others from being on the platform, all else equal. At T equals one and two, two users are randomly matched. So in each round, one and two, users are matched with other users. And if both users are on the platform, then they're able to transact with each other. So your utility, and we're borrowing from the international trade literature, is gonna be some utility over your own endowment or your own consumption good, and then some utility over your trading partner's consumption good. And A to C is gonna measure the degree of complementarity. So if you don't transact, so you don't find a transaction partner, then you get nothing. It's just normalized to zero. But if you do match, which is an endogenous outcome because the probability of matching depends on how many other users there are on the platform, you're gonna follow the usual standard international um, econ type of way of solving them all, which is you're gonna consume a fixed fraction of your own endowment and a fixed fraction of the endowment of your trading partner where the fractions are one minus A to C and A to C. And this is rather standard in this literature. So if this is your utility, then what you might notice is that the only difference across users is that some have higher endowments than others. So if you have a high endowment, you're really excited to be on the platform. 
if you don't have a high endowment, you're less excited. So this is naturally going to lend itself to a cutoff strategy. So the cutoff strategy will be if your expected utility from transacting on the platform is higher than some cutoff. So your expected utility is the amount that you get from your own endowment and the expectation of the utility you get from consuming the endowment good of your trading partner. And of course, this is an endogenous object and you have to form expectations about who is on the platform. So there's gonna be selection. So as a benchmark, what is the first best equilibrium? Well, that's kind of straightforward. There's gonna be a critical cutoff, A star first best. And if A is greater than A star first best, then everyone is on the platform and that's optimal from a planner's perspective. If A is less than first best, then the net benefits of being on the platform from transactions is gonna be less than the, the net cost of running the platform in terms of participation, uh, user participation costs, and it's gonna be best to shutter the platform. No, it's, it's two-sided platform. So users meet with each other. So one is gonna be a buyer, one's gonna be a seller, and they're just gonna transact with each other. So you can think of it as, over a period of time, each period can be like a year or two years, whatever it may be. You're going to run into people and trade with each other. No, so sorry. we're thinking of this. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I wasn't aware of it. No, it's one-sided. Everybody is the, everybody is, uh, can trade with anybody else. A two-sided platform is when you've got two sides and side people from side A try to trade with side B. I see. So if, if that's your convention, yeah, then it would be one-sided. That's not my convention. I think that's the standard uh, definition. And you know, ah. in particular, some of the insights you attribute to uh, La Fuentirol, I mean, and I'm all, uh, La Fuentirol, uh, Rocher Roche. and Tirol, and I'm all, all for giving them all the possible credit in the world, but are much before then to uh, all the people who developed the theory in the 80s. I mean, it's, uh, it's just a question of making sure that we keep the terminology right between what's one-sided and two-sided. Sure, thank you Thank you for the clarification. So yes, we, we just think of this as users are transacting with each other. There aren't dedicated sides, I agree with that. Okay, so then, then that is one-sided and you know, um, I think it's important. Okay, no, 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 uh, per, I'm, I'm glad to have that, have that clarification. I appreciate that. So um, I will try not to ambiguate oh, going. That's fine, we forgive you for the rest of the talk. We won't for we won't forgive you if we see it in the published version of a paper. <laughs> I, I will keep that in mind. Thank you. Jack, you may have missed the fact that the paper is already forthcoming, so I'm not sure whether that can be changed. We, uh, we can certainly try, I think, forthcoming, but uh, it's well appreciated. We appreciate that uh, clarification. So I want the name of the editor now. <laughs> OK, uh, the, the editor will be up. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't want to pull them out, but uh, you can certainly see who the editor is. It is uh, Bruno, but um, uh, I'll, I'll we, we can defer that discussion till afterwards. Just so, yeah, that we sure, sure. so the first best is that either everyone is on the platform or no, um, from based on the user's participation costs. So now that we have the first best, we'll go through the equity-based scheme and then through the token-based scheme. So in the equity-based scheme, there's a representative owner, as I said, who has equity and control of the platform. The owner can do two things. One, provide an entry fee or a subsidy C at T equals one. So we think of the subsidy as Google offering free search or free email. And we're just going to limit the amount of subsidy so that the problem doesn't become trivial. You can subsidize up to a fraction alpha of the participation cost. And you can think of this as if you give everything away for free at a very high level, you're gonna have opportunistic users come on just for the free subsidies, and not really to use the platform. So on the other, the second thing the owner can do is have a transaction. So the transaction fee is gonna be a fraction delta of the transaction surplus from any two users transacting. And the last thing the owner can do is a time two can take a subversive action, S element of zero, one. Zero means no subversion, one means subversion. And the owner, if the, the owner subverts a T equals two, is gonna get gamma per user, where gamma is a reduced form benefit, such as selling user data, providing aggressive advertising, whatever it may be. And it's gonna cost users. So this is value, it's a zero sum transfer, but it's value destroying for the user. 
the user gets minus gamma at time two. And for simplicity, there's no transaction at time two. For users, the platform effectively blows up, but that's not really important. That just helps to illustrate the point. So what does the owner's profit look like? Well, the owner is going to pay out any subsidization or take any fixed cost to C across users. It's going to get the transaction surplus delta times delta for the fees at time one. At time two, either it gets the, the fees again, or it instead subverts and gets gamma per user. And the important thing is that the owner lacks commitment. The owner cannot commit to an action at time zero or time one when selling to, uh, when issuing equity um, to outside stakeholders and setting fees for users. So the optimization for whether or not to subvert is based only on time two profits. So at time two, the owner gets the transaction fee if he does not subvert or gamma times uh, uh, gamma per user if he does subvert. And of course, ex post, you're gonna do this if the value from subverting exceeds the transaction fees at time two. So when are you going to do this when the transaction fees are sufficiently low? And the key conflict, again, is this is an optimization at time two. It doesn't take into account the full profits at time one or the user participation decision because users are already on the platform at time two. There's nothing they can do. So user I is going to anticipate this. So user I will join the platform if the transaction benefit that he or she receives less the transaction fee, so one minus delta, exceeds kappa, the cost of participating, the fixed fee, which will be negative if it's a subsidy. And if there's subversion, instead of getting the benefit, they're going to face a cost, minus gamma s. So we can see a subversion effectively is going to ask, act like an additional cost on the user if subversion is anticipated. So the possibility of owner subversion is going to add to user participation costs and also reduce the benefit. So this is like the key tension for the owner. The owner ex post can't control himself. If fees are low, he's going to exploit the users. But ex ante, he would like to commit not to because users anticipate this, so less users join the platform initially, further defeating the fees that the owner will get. So what's the equilibrium look like? There's going to be two cutoffs. A star E and A star star E. So if A is greater than the first cutoff, everything is great. The platform is strong. The owner is going to fully subsidize as much as he can. And there's going to be a fees that are endogenously set that the expressions are given in the paper. Because they're not so intuitive, I'm not going to display them here. But essentially, if A is greater than some cutoff, things are great. If A is between two other cut uh, A star star and A star, that's when we get into this subversion equilibrium. So again, the owner is still going to subsidize as much as possible to get as many people on the platform as he or she can. It's going to set a fee that's somewhat similar to that uh, without subversion. But now the owner is going to take a subversive action at t equals 2. So users are going to anticipate this, and they're going to change how the cutoff at which they join for the same fundamental. So without subversion, more people join. With subversion, you anticipate this. So now less users join because they face a higher effective participation cost. And what's kind of interesting is because of the network effect, user participation, owner profit, and social surplus are all decreasing in the degree of exploitation. So even though ex post it's great if you can exploit, ex ante it's self-defeating because of the network effect. As soon as some users get off the platform because of this exploitation, more users are going to leave because there's a reverse network effect going on here. So the network effect is great when you're building a platform. It also defeats you very quickly when you go against it. So below the second cutoff, the platform breaks down. So that, that's kind of the equity-based platform. The utility-based platform is slightly different. The developer is going to cash out a time one by selling tokens, is going to set up a bunch of pre-coded algorithms, that have no ability to exploit users. We'll return to that again in the extension. So the way this is going to work is a user buys a token to join the platform at time one, transacts with another match user at time one, two, and in addition to the personal cost, is going to pay some token price P. There's no subsidy of user participation because, again, all the owner is going to do is sell the tokens and walk away. So in addition to your fixed cost of kappa, you also have to buy a token. 
So again, in the background, there's perfect consensus. There's majority rule for tokens. It's going to be a frictionless token platform to give tokens the best chance at being a superior funding scheme. So the owner's profits are slightly different now. The owner just gets the token sales. So that's the number of tokens sold for this object here times the price per token. And ZT is just a transformation of the cutoff at which users join. So users will join if A is greater, if their AI is greater than or equal to some A hat T and stay off the platform otherwise. So the key difference, this is a marginal user's participation decision is this indifference condition here for the marginal user. Notice the difference from this expression. Instead of transaction fees in the substate, instead, you're just paying the token price P over here. And because it enters as kappa plus P, it's effectively raising the cost of entry. So tokens are inherently costly to start with because there's no subsidization. And in fact, you're charging users even more to use the platform. So P deters users, and that's further exacerbating the network. So the token price is determined by the marginal user because this is the last guy who enters who determines the token price. Compared to, in the case of the equity platform, the transaction fees were closer to like equity. It's based on the average user. So automatically we see that tokens are giving up a lot. They act as a tax on users, deterring participation, and they're somewhat inefficient at extracting revenue. They get the marginal users convenience yield, whereas transaction fees get the average. So you're giving up a lot as an owner to use tokens. So what does the platform equilibrium look like? There are only two cutoffs now because there's no subversion. So below A star star T, platform breaks down just as before. But above there, you have a unique cutoff where platform operates for two periods, users trade with each other, and there's no subversive action. So now I just want to compare these two schemes. Given a level of subversion, if A is sufficiently high, the equity platform dominates the token platform. As you'd expect, if there's no incentive to subvert, there's no reason to issue tokens because you're giving up a lot of revenue. Similarly, given A, if gamma is sufficiently high, so the incentive to exploit is sufficiently high, token platform dominates equity platform. So for a given A, if gamma is sufficiently high, you subvert. And so you're going to want to issue tokens. Similarly, if gamma, for fixing gamma, if A is sufficiently low, you want to support. So we're kind of building out the space over which you would want to use tokens. So you get higher user participation, owner profit, and social surplus for tokens when you use tokens, and higher user participation, surplus, and profit uh, for the equity platform when you optimally use equity. So what this suggests is we can construct a threshold. The threshold is more general than what I'm showing here, but for the sake of fixing ideas, suppose there's a normal prior. If there's a normal prior, you're going to choose equity if your prior belief about the platform is above some threshold. And more generally, it's based upon the distributions of your beliefs. But if you're sufficiently optimistic about the platform, A hat is sufficiently high, then you're going to want to do equity. And if you're not that confident and you're worried about subversion undermining the network effect, that's when you're going to think about tokens. So the prediction of this model is token platforms tend to have relatively weak ex-ante fundamentals. Ex post, they can be great. But from an ex-ante perspective, this concern really shows up for those weaker platforms. And there's some empirical evidence that documents skewed distributions, for instance, for ICO proceeds. It suggests that for the most part, they have on average low payoffs, but occasionally you get some right tail. And we think that's kind of consistent. So can we have decentralization with, to with tokenization? Sorry, with subsidization? So the, we're going to go now just in the last five minutes to the two extensions. So suppose instead of issuing utility tokens, oh, we have a question. The optimal from a social surplus point of view, the optimal there is everyone's on the platform if the fundamental is sufficiently strong. So if A is above that first best cutoff, you want everyone on. And if it's below, you don't want anyone on in that case. Yeah, and so the equity, yes. Of the two uh, forms you have, which one is the better? Is tokenization better or is, uh, I mean, if, if you could have a law saying you're not allowed tokenization or you're not allowed uh, the, the, uh, 
developer, you know which one you would choose? So it goes, social surplus is perfectly aligned with user participation in the setting, ignoring inequality of transfers. So depending on which one you think gets higher participation, that's the scheme that planner would want to use. Okay. In this you. sense, they're aligned between the two. So that, that's great because that gets to this last point here uh, the, where I talk about um, how subsidization interacts with decentralization. So in this case, we're going to have it that the owner can issue something a bit different than utilities. Instead of just getting a convenience yield, suppose you can also pay dividends. So you can pay it like a stock a dividend based on the transaction fees of users. So with only users, you're gonna get the first best outcome because now you can pay out huge dividends to the marginal user, the marginal user's gonna join, you can get everyone on the platform with the proper choice of subsidies via these, these dividends that the equity token pays. So the optimal here, it's kind of trivial, but illustrates the point. 100% transaction fees, so all users get the same payoff. Everyone joins if it's, within, if it's socially optimal to join, and the owner retains zero stake. Basically, it's, it's endogenously optimal for the owner to sell everything, because they want everyone on the platform that maximizes the value of the, the tokens that they sell. So what this says is that it seems like assigning cash flow rights to subsidize tokens improves on utility tokens, which it does. So you see like a harmony between decentralization subsidization. If you could provide dividends via tokens, that acts as a subsidy just as the C did in the equity platform. And that's great. That gets everyone on the platform. So it seems like this is the best of both worlds. So what we want to argue, though, is this introduces some bad incentives. Suppose an outside investor can buy equity tokens. This outside investor doesn't care about using the platform, they just want the dividend. And because they don't use the platform, they don't pay a fixed participation. So the investor, what the investor can do is if the investor buys enough tokens, they get enough voting rights to be able to control the platform at time two. So if you acquire over 50% of the tokens, you can then vote to act like an owner. In which case, of course, you can take that subversive action that the owner could if it were an equity platform. So what we show is that when the fundamental is low and subversion would be optimal, you might have a inv outside investor buy enough tokens to be able to act like the owner and subvert the platform at time two. And this is kind of a vicious cycle. Why? Well, if users anticipate being exploited at time two, that lowers the value of tokens at time one, if it lowers the value of tokens, it's easier for the owner to, uh, sorry, for the investor to acquire that majority stake. So it's kind of a self-defeating kind of um, self-fulfilling expectation. So the way we kind of think about this has been pointed out is the issue is that these governance algorithms can't distinguish between users and investors. At least this is a current issue with these platforms. So if you think of MakerDAO and Kyber, you have weighting votes by stake token holdings. So they don't distinguish between who uses the platform and just someone who's holding the tokens for their returns. There's also, so what we suggest is maybe one should uh, weight token, uh, sorry, weight votes by platform usage. So we should try to make sure only users vote on the platform, not just people who own the tokens, which is kind of the current standard. And I show, for example, MakerDAO and Kyber as two platforms that kind of do that right now. So my final point is uh, I left aside the issue of, of consensus. So a big issue on these platforms is that you need to have anonymous record keepers keeping track of transactions and adding them to the blockchain. There's a huge literature on this, uh, both for proof of work and now the more contemporary proof of stake. So the last point we're gonna make at a very high level is giving control and cash flow rights to record keepers can reintroduce this commitment problem. And what we do is we put together a game, I'll describe it at a high level. If, if all the validators behave, they get the transaction fees just as the owner would in the equity platform. But if the fundamental is weak, then you can have someone attack the platform. One of the validators may go rogue. And we show in a mixed strategy, um, a game theoretic uh, competition between the honest miners and the rogue validator that the road validator is more likely to succeed at attacking the platform when the fundamental is weak, because in that situation, validators are devoting less uh, computing power or devoting less of a stake 
to maintaining the platform. So we think that this is somewhat consistent with empirical evidence because up until this point, all the attacks on blockchains have been through these platforms with uh, weaker fundamentals and lower prices. So Feathercoin, Bitcoin Cash, Verge, they tend to have smaller market caps and less usage. Those tend to be the ones at least we've seen until now um, being attacked as a platform. So just to summarize and apologize for being a minute over, so decentralization through tokenization comes with both costs and benefits. The new insight hopefully uh, that came across is decentralized tokens allow platforms to pre-commit not to exploit user data at the cost of having no owner to subsidize user participation. And that's important because we need to maximize the network effect. And this decentralization is fragile. There are many incentives to re-centralize the platform, to reintroduce the commitment problem. The two examples we give is outside investors may acquire a majority stake. This seems particularly relevant because a lot of the push for broader adoption has been to money managers and to institutional investors in addition to retail. And consensus validators may attack the blockchain at the user's expense. So thank you so much for listening to me and I look forward to my discussion's comments. Thank you, Michael. Um... You really kept the time pretty well, giving me quite a few questions. So um, Hannah Halliburta is the expert on platforms and blockchain, uh, and she's going to discuss this paper for five minutes or so. Share my slides. Uh, thank you, Julian. And uh, um, thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this paper. And because this paper is, is already forthcoming in a journal of finance, I'm not going to go uh, via typical route of a discussant where I'm going to suggest improvements on the paper because that's a little bit behind the point. And especially that here we have, um, I mean, we really wanted this paper to be presented to this audience, a platform of, uh, audience of platform researchers uh, because it is of, of great interest to us. So instead of giving comments on, you know, nitty gritty details about the papers and how about if you change this or that or add another assumption, I wanted to focus on, um, on actually talking to the audience about how we can use the findings of these papers and the modeling approach uh, to forward our research on platforms. So with my apologies to the authors, it's not going to be particularly useful for improvement of this paper, but then that probably would not be socially optimal at this point. Um, so this, uh, this paper um, uh, it really builds on a lot, of, um, a lot of interesting aspects of platforms that we have already, uh, we, we have already looked at uh, in platforms literature. So it seems that finance literature got really interested in platforms with DeFi and with, uh, with, with ICOs and, and with tokens. And we could see it from Michael's literature that all the papers referred in the literature were coming from 2018 onwards, uh, which is kind of a natural, uh, natural meeting point of finance and platforms. But in platforms, we actually have a quite rich literature on platform governance that goes back, uh, you know, much, much, uh, uh, it's much older than 2018. So I want to kind of point out two aspects of this literature. One is that um, uh, we have uh, Andre's result from 2006 about the importance of commitment and uh, commitment of platform to future pricing. And uh, this is a, a very, a very similar dynamics. If a platform cannot commit in the future to a particular pricing and therefore has incentive to exploit the users who have already joined, uh, then uh, or using the users that already joined exploit the future users, then this is going to affect the incentive of the users to, to join in the beginning of the platform's existence. That paper is a, a, a bona fide two-sided paper as what, uh, what Jacques was saying is that we first have uh, 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 video game developers, let's say, and then the gamers. But if uh, the platform cannot commit to the pricing for the second time, it's not going to, uh, for the second site, it's not going to attract the first site. Um, so, um, and, uh, you know, this 
two types of, uh, of users that we typically think about in two-sided context. I kind of wanted to make this remark here, given that Jacques already talked about two-sidedness. We can uh, use a similar logic to thinking about the first period users and second period users, because they are in a way different. If you attract the users in the first period, it makes it easier to attract users in the second period. And it gives the same incentive to exploit as when we attracted one side and now we want to make money on the, on the second side okay and then we have a literature i mean it's not the main point of platform strategy uh, research we typically focus on platforms that are centrally managed uh, and uh, and so what what uh, uh, what Michael uh, in the paper is equity platform, but there is a significant uh, research uh, focusing on open platforms where where the users are managing the platforms, making decisions. And uh, the main examples here are Linux and Wikipedia, and how those platforms work, and how they create network effects, and how they compete against the platforms like Linux against uh, against Microsoft, for example. And what we see in that literature is that for a given size of the network, open platform will open this kind of decentralized platform will offer higher customer surplus because there is no centralized platform provider who will exploit and charge high prices for, uh, for, for the service. But at the same time, the open platforms network is smaller. So on net, there may be a negative, uh, the, negative the, the open platform may be less preferred by the users, even though the platform is not exploiting them. And why is open platform, open, uh, open platforms network smaller is because there is no incentive, there are no incentives to subsidize early users and grow the network exactly because there is, the, 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 there is no proprietor or the, of the network who can later recoup the uh, recoup the investment of uh, of subsidizing. So this kind of uh, of uh, uh, open platforms that have been traditionally uh, analyzed in platforms literature, they always have open access, um, of, 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 which is the same as having no cost, right? So you join a platform and you are not paying, because Wikipedia, Linux, and so on, because traditionally before blockchain and tokenization, we did not have a way to monetize uh, in a decentralized platform. The moment you have a payment system, the moment you pay with a credit card, you need to have someone who is centralizing, who is a central authority uh, 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 in the platform. And, um, and that kind of opens up this question that if we move from uh, traditional platforms to blockchain platforms, and you know, for some of you, this slide may be familiar because I took it from one of my older presentations, is that with the uh, with 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 blockchain uh, and smart contracts, uh, we uh, we can allow or we can have algorithmization of governance via DAOs, for example, and that may give us a unique opportunity, a new opportunity, uh, to have uh, those open platforms and co platforms to have uh, to be at the same time decentralized and be able to monetize. And now the question is, can they perform better against the, the standard platforms that we have, a kind of equity platforms or not? And this is where you know, we had this question as an open question earlier in platforms. And your paper is already first step to show us that uh, that may not necessarily be enough. So um, I basically uh, call the centrally managed platforms to lose platforms. Uh, of uh, coming coming back from the you know the early descriptions and then the decentralized the platforms that may allow for decentralization and monetization at the same time Nakamoto platforms okay so uh, in this paper what we are seeing that also when we have tokenization and we use those tools of decentralization with monetization where the where the users can make can make profit, where the, the token can have a price and we can maintain this decentralization, we still see a similar effect as we had seen for the traditional open platforms that could not charge for access, even though the model is much more complicated. And now we can we can see that those forces are much uh, uh, much stronger. It's not it was not just a problem of monetization. So the decentralized platform increased user surplus 
but uh, for the same size of the network, but achieve a smaller size because no incentives uh, to there are no incentives to subsidize earlier on. What uh, what what uh, Michael and Wei are showing is that it is actually possible to overcome the shortcoming of the traditional open platforms with equity tokens, right? And this is where you're showing that you can have this first best with decentralization and there is subsidization if there is a transfer of, uh, a transfer of, uh, of payoffs between the first period and the second period via equity token in a decentralized way. Um, however, it works only if the equity tokens are not transferable as if I may paraphrase. And that kind of relates to a, um, a different literature that we had in platforms. And this was on the platform-based digital currencies. And this was referring to Facebook credit, Amazon coin, War of Warcraft, gold, uh, kind of the traditional platforms, not the decentralized platforms. But um, the, the, the research there was basically showing that if we have transferability of those, uh, of those coins, uh, then the transferability is detrimental to network effects. And this is why platforms very often when they set up those, uh, the, 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 the currency or coins on the platform for use on the platform, they very often restrict functionality. They don't want it to be generally uh, accepted means of payment because they want to maintain the, the currency on the platform uh, to increase network effects. And there seems to be this flavor of this, of, of, uh, of, of a similar um, of, of similar kind of dynamics that you want to keep it on the platform, you want to keep it with the users. You don't want the, uh, the, the revenue streams to spill outside of the platform, okay? So what it very interestingly shows is that while this decentralized, the, uh, combining decentralization with monetization that is offered by smart contracts and blockchains, it can help us solve some of the issues that we have identified earlier in platforms literature. It also, in, it also introduces new, new issues, new aspects and new problems. And that gives us uh, you know, more, more topics to work on as platforms researchers. So where can we, where can we take it from here? Hannah, How can Hannah, we, just, yes, well, uh, this is the last yeah. slide. Okay, uh, we, so we've the, got five minutes to the hour, so we've got okay. to leave a little bit of time for others. So I will just, just basically say that we can look into the different structure of the platforms that may lead to different results. So MakerDAO and Filecoin are different in their nature than Bitcoin or Ethereum. And you can kind of analyze it the same way, but they are different. And we have similarly in in, in platforms of, of two-sided, one-sided platform and so on. Uh, there may be potentially conflict of interest between the users, which you completely abstract away, and it may have a big impact on how the platform functions. We talk about optimal design of token, token functionality. And what is really important for me is the competition, either between the open platforms or between the decentralized platform and centralized platform, and how they how this will um, uh, this will play out. So those are kind of open questions that I wanted to throw out out there. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Julian, for letting me go yeah. over time.